Hey, hey, party people. I want to talk about a type of designing many of us love using a period of fashion history as inspiration. For costume designers, the goal is usually to make period clothes as accurate as possible. For fashion designers, the goal is to use the historical references to make a modern looking collection. Otherwise, people will say your clothes look dated. And trust me, dated is never a compliment in an industry all about the new and the fresh. Okay? And I know there are businesses out there that focus on making vintage reproductions, but they fit more in that keeping things close to accurate category. The key for fashion designers to keep their vintage inspired designs modern is to infuse modern and new and different elements at every stage of the design process. And so this video will go over how to infuse work with vintage inspiration to create a modern collection within each step of the design process. So what's the first step? Inspiration, mood board images, all that good stuff, okay? So let's say you come across an old photo and you feel inspired by it. This is the main inspo image I'll be using today. These people are Bill Gates and Microsoft's first employees taken in 1978. This photo is actually the inspiration for this video. My husband posted this photo on Twitter and I was immediately enamored. I posted on Twitter how much I wanted to design a collection based on this image and people were like, do it. So I did it. Look at this image and think about what specific elements you love about it. I love the extreme geek vibes, the awkward company group photo vibes and that kind of dowdy chic feel. And I wanted to translate that to some kind of awkward proportions and offbeat colors. I wanted to think about clothes that got shrunk in the laundry and also things that were oversized. And you know, all the different styles of facial hair are seriously giving me life. And uh, I want to do something with it. I don't know what yet. I think it depends on how avant-garde my brand is. Okay. You definitely need to merge the concepts in this photo with other concepts to create something fresh and one approach to make it not look straight up 70s is to merge it with another period of fashion history. Now there are decades that already look similar to each other so avoid that. Like if you look at the 80s you can see how there are a lot of silhouette and shape references from the 40s, the big shoulders and kind of like that tapered, the big shoulder to the tapered waist look. And so I wouldn't pair those two together. Okay? You can take a lot of the frilly, lacy, over-the-top embellishments from the Bella Polk era and put them on some sleek, slim, modern 70s silhouettes that's one approach or you could go the other way and take like all the brown corduroy and the shearling and the burnt orange and put them on some more hourglass silhouettes from the Bella Polk. You can merge this photo inspiration with the theme that someone wouldn't associate with the 70s Americana vibe. You can go nuts. Pick embroideries done in art deco patterns and do them in neon colors and maybe those neon colors are really fat yarns not the shiny skinny silk threads you know and I'm a broken record about this but those of you who are new to me and my channel listen your design decisions should center around the needs and desires of your specific customer what works for Juicy Couture probably does not work for Givenchy. They each have their own specific customer, what they like, how they live, what kind of clothes they wear. And every decision you make in the design and development process should link back to what your brand is and who your customer is. Next step is picking your color story off your inspiration. I want to keep the general sepia tones color story of this photo. The orange, burnt orange, persimmon, brown, reddish brown, camel, tobacco. And then, like some sort of color magic, we have these blues, which is the complement of orange. And this might sound mean, but I really doubt that they planned it that way. So it's kind of amazing to me that you have like a perfect complementary color story going on in this photo. <laughs> 
A color palette that is heavy on oranges and browns screams 70s fall winter. Okay. The browns, oranges, and camels are very 70s. And on top of that, we associate those like brown tinted sepia or photographs with the 70s and 80s as well. And, uh, you know, one direction to keep this more modern is to lean more into the blues, the camels, and the dark browns and keeping the oranges more as accent colors, you know, small bits in prints and embellishments. Or, you know, I could start thinking about adding other colors to really lift it, add some freshness. For example, you know, a soft creamy white would work here, but it would also keep it looking vintage and dated. So what other direction could we go into? So here's an option. We could use a split complementary color scheme instead. Keep my oranges and browns. Browns, of course, are basically dark oranges. And then use blue greens and blue violets. You know, maybe I want a midnight teal and black plaid with a lime green stripe. Or I could do the split complement of blue and also use yellow orange and red orange. It's kind of like a muted primary color story. That could work. Okay. You could look for some other modern inspo. We, we could go a little Wes Anderson funky. No other film director does color stories like Wes Anderson. Or we could go back to my super random Art Deco embroideries and neon colors idea and add some neons. Next step is picking your fabrics. Just a quick disclaimer, these swatches are all really old. So if you see any pricing, it's all old pricing. So don't rely on that. Okay. So fabric choice number one should reflect the season that you're designing. So let's go with fall. And you know, when I talk to people about starting their own companies, I tell them all start small, start with one category of clothing, like start with pants or start with sweaters or whatever. But for the sake of giving you the most information in this video, let's pretend we're designing a full collection which means we'll need different fabrics for jackets and coats. Some of those lighter jacket fabrics can and should be also used for pants and some styles of skirts and dresses and vests. These are your bottom weight fabrics. Denim is a great example of a lighter bottom weight, jackets, pants, skirts, vests. It's heavy enough, but it's on the lighter side of bottom weights. Like heavy coat fabrics, like a thick Melton wool cashmere blend, you know, they're thick, they're wonderful, they make great coats, they are also a bottom weight, but they would be really uncomfortable made into pants. And I know you Brits out there call underwear pants, so now I'm picturing wool Melton underpants and can't stop laughing. <laughs> so itchy. Okay. And uh, when I said some skirts and some dresses can be done in bottom weights, I mean, you can make skirts out of floaty chiffons, but you can also make skirts out of denim. So it really depends on the style. And then you'll need some top weights, you know, things you can make blouses out of, things you can make t-shirts out of, you know, and since it's fall, I'd throw in one or two sweater knits. And remember, you must choose fabrics that suit your brand's price point. Okay. I sell Kashi templates at zoehong.etsy.com. Use them to calculate backwards what prices, fabrics you can afford for your brand. Every single fabric and thus every single garment should be offered in multiple colors. If you design a great blouse, you should offer it in blue, in persimmon, and in navy. Okay. And uh, the only exception is if the fabric is really special, that that piece is a novelty item, like something completely covered in crystals and beads or something like that. This crazy pony skin, python embossed pony skin suede thing that I have going on, that would be a good example of a novelty that you might not find in a lot of colors and just offer this one dark teal. For prints, I definitely want a plaid. That's not even vintage. Plaid is classic. You know, the old Scottish family tartans have been around forever and are still fashionable. Modern colorizations crop up all the time and plaid will always be in fashion. It's just a matter of how it's used. Okay. So we could have a few, uh, we could have a few plaids 
in different scales, you know, one very large scale plaid and one teeny tiny check. I also have this idea of creating a placed print. Okay? A placed print is when the garment is cut strategically on the print fabric, so the design is centered on where the print is. And, you know, there are a couple of flower prints here. I want a shirt where the flowers grow up from the waist, like lavender or heather growing up from a pale teal cotton shirt. The print is designed like this. It's printed on the fabric this way. Here's your selvage. Here's the green line for the shirt. And that's where you place your pattern pieces. And then in the unprinted areas, you can cut yokes and collar pieces, etc. And then I want those neon embroideries. I also want to think about textures, maybe something that looks like shag carpeting. I can't stop staring at those beards. And I absolutely need a brooch that looks like the tops of these pens sticking out of the pocket protector. Okay. And uh, I want some big oversized sweaters, cardigans. So I'm going to go hunt down some yarns. All right. Now, armed with these tools, inspiration, colors, prints, textures, proportions, and my customer in mind, let's start sketching. I know this video started with images of me sketching, but I didn't start sketching until I had mapped out the images, the inspiration I was going to use, the colors, and the fabrics. In my last video, I talked about the difference between quick design sketches and the fastest way to do them versus fashion illustration. And we're doing super fast design sketches here. The goal is not to display these sketches. The goal is to get ideas down on paper as fast as possible before I forget what I was thinking. <laughs> Literally just oh, can't forget, can't forget, jot it down. If I was working on this project in the industry, I would then pick the best designs and start doing flats in Adobe Illustrator. For school projects, obviously you have to follow your class instructions, but for portfolios, you'll want a mood board, boards with your customer info, your color story, your fabrics, full illustrations of your outfits, front and back flats in Illustrator, and possibly a tech pack for one of your more difficult garments. And uh, I have a lot of videos on design process and portfolio, so go check out my playlist. And this is a little trick that I use all the time when I'm sketching. If I have an embroidery or some kind of decoration, I will quickly sketch it out on tracing paper and just move it around my design so that I can kind of figure out where I want it. You know, do I want it on the sleeve? Do I want it on the hip? Do I want it across their chest? You know, things like that instead of sketching and erasing and sketching and erasing over and over again. And then once I figure out where I want it, I can draw it on my sketch. If you want to learn more about the differences in the design process you learn in school and the design process in the industry, you can check out my Patreon podcast. I'll post a link to my Patreon in the description box below. The first episode is dropping January 14th, and that episode will focus on the design process, school versus the industry. Podcasts are published in the captive audience tier. Okay, so go check out that link. So while we're here, I just wanna give you a quick little bit on Art Deco. So Art Deco is a style of visual arts that uh, influenced the design of fashion, jewelry, cars, trains, architecture, furniture, ordinary objects like radios and vacuum cleaners, just everything. It originated in the early 1900s, and it takes its name, Art Deco, from the Exposition Internationale de Art Decoratif et Industriel Moderne, held in Paris in 1925. I'm sure that pronunciation was terrible, but anyway, that's where Art Deco gets its name. And I did discuss the expo in the second of my fashion history series, the one where I go over the 20s, which I will link below. Art Deco, during its heyday, the 20s and 30s, uh, Art Deco represented luxury, glamour, and technological process in its heavy use of metallics, its organic merging of modern geometric shapes and simplified versions of fluid botanicals. And Art Deco is all about modern lines, craftsmanship, and luxurious materials. 
So traditional Art Deco would never incorporate embroideries and decorative stitching with fat neon yarns, but you know, we're having we're having some fun mixing it up today. <laughs> you know, the using fat yarns to do decorative stitching is definitely more of a folksy 70s vibe. The neon is much more futuristic, and then the Art Deco is just like a different element. So again, it's like that mixing of different references that prevents it from looking straight up 70s. So now that I've been sketching a bit, what do you think? Do you think my designs look modern while referencing my original inspiration? And some of you may be thinking, Zoe, your designs don't look anything like what the Microsoft people are wearing. Yes, that's the point, okay? That Microsoft photo, it's strictly inspiration. I'm not doing that V-neck sweater again in an in a modern cashmere. I'm not doing, you know, the shirts they're pretty similar although I'm not doing those big giant 70s collars, you know. The point is not to reproduce slightly differently. It's to use the 70s as a springboard as inspiration to move beyond and design something new. Okay? Please give this video a thumbs up if you learned something new today. Drop me your questions in the comment section below and check the description box for links to my social media, links to related videos, link to my Patreon, share, subscribe. And remember, my current schedule is new video every first Tuesday, new Patreon podcast every second Tuesday, and live stream every third Tuesday. Remember, we repeat the design process with multiple projects over and over and over again because we're not made of magic, we're made of practice. So hashtag practice not magic, hashtag always be practicing, and I'll see you in the next video.